Conscience free, how sweet would be their children's fate if they like them could die for thee. Faith of our fathers, holy faith, we will be true to thee till death. friends and foe in all our strife and preach thee to us love knows how by kindly words and virtuous life faith of our fathers holy faith we will be true to thee Sister Donna. Oh, praise the name of Jesus. Praise the name of the Lord. Father, we are so glad that you invited us into your courts to Amen. worship you this morning. And despite whatever happened this week and how our week have been, you, the good and righteous God, has given us the holy Sabbath day of rest and gladness. You have offered us double blessings. Hallelujah. Amen. And dear God, we are grateful. We are in our right minds. And so we have come in obedience to your word. And we have come to just praise your name, bless you, lift you up, and to be drawn closer to you. So may we have a wonderful Sabbath sitting. Be with Seventh-day Adventist Sabbath worship all over the world. May, wherever they're gathered on the trees or in, you know, big sanctuaries, what, wherever, may we all experience you in a special way today, we pray for Christ's sake. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning, brothers and sisters. Happy Sabbath. And happy Father's Day. And now I expect to see all the fathers smiling, but I, I'm going to be honest, half of you got your head down. Some of you got your head looking way up. So I just want to see you looking straight forward. Let's try this again. Happy Father's Day, fathers. Now, I could, go around, I could ask the names that you have been called by, but I think I'm, I, I have a fairly good idea what they are. Daddy, Dad, Pop, Papa, Pa, even Father. And when I say fathers, I'm talking about fathers and grandfathers and everybody. Because Bradley calls Kenny Papa D. I don't know what that means, but she calls him Papa D. Pete, what do your children call you? Daddy. Brother Tyrone. Papa. Papa. See, I was right. Brother Mario? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's so long, you say? Brother Luti. What do your children call you? Brother Godfrey? Daddy. 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 So I guess whenever, whenever the moon hit there, they call it something different. I could understand that because when daddy was alive, sometimes people like to trouble me and call Angelico. So different moods on different occasions. Right. The term fathering means to treat with protective care. It means being involved, behaving responsibly, being emotionally engaged and present physically available, providing financial support, and having spiritual influence in child raising. Most of all, it means being a representation of God's character on earth, 
Fathers, it means, you know what? You are supposed to represent God when you're dealing with your children. When they see your behavior, you are supposed to be patterning the image of God. A father who is filled with love, compassion, patience, and care. These are the key fatherly characteristics that you need to emulate when you're raising your children. Our children cannot become godly children on their own. They may outwardly conform to your standards, but their hearts can be had as rock, trust me. Because they would not have yielded to God's will. You see, sometimes you can think you're raising good children. It doesn't mean they're not good persons, but sometimes you might be raising Pharisees. And when I say Pharisees, you know, sometimes I've heard children say, straight up. They could say what you want, you know, but I don't know why I believe, and I will know what I think. So guess what? You walk in the good walk, but inside, if you have not conformed in your heart to submit to the will of Jesus, you're still not fully walking in the way God wants you to. Now, if I were to ask a question... But I'm not going to ask it as yet. You can't do what God calls you to do on your own strength. You must be willing to be a failure in order that God can work through you to bring forth his life in you. Now, I know many of us don't like to fail. And all of us want to believe we are very good fathers. I'm not a father. But very good fathers or very good parenting. Before the Industrial Revolution, dads worked side by side with their children and both taught and lived out the critical character traits needed for a successful life. Traits such as honesty, patience, integrity, hard work, and perseverance. Traits that helped build a great nation. When the Industrial Revolution showed up, fathers left their farms and headed to the factories. Long work days, which they, we still have going on now, swing shifts, set the stage for fathers becoming more and more absent. And let me ask the question, how many of you actually reach home? Fathers, how many of you could tell me that by 5 o'clock you are actually at home or 5.30? Not the retired ones. Don't come and put up your hand. I see Brad Tyrone smiling. Those of you who are... <laughs> but I will smell. I'm not talking about the retired ones. How many of you can say that you're actually home by 5:30? Where you say, Pete? You? Where you say, Brother Stubby? You walk from home, so by 5:30 you home. I guess Brother Pete, you're gonna say the same thing too, and Brother Tyrone. Okay, you gotta see now. Dads made the money and moms did, mom did everything else because fathers were regarded as the breadwinners. That kind of thinking has a negative effect on the home, though. You see, for today, let's use America as an example. Today in America, 43% of children live without their fathers. 90% of, of all of the homeless and vulnerable children, that's what they are, without fathers. 71% of all pregnant teenagers 71% of high school dropouts, 75% of adolescent patients in chemical or abuse centers come from fatherless homes. Fatherless children are twice as likely to drop out of school, twice as likely to end up in jail, four times more likely to need help for behavioral problems. Some people ask, are fathers necessary? Let me ask the question, do you think fathers are necessary? Says that women, do you think fathers are necessary? So you say that oh, they're only there for the procreation?
So you are, you are saying fathers are necessary. Why? Okay, yes is, sorry, yes is the event. Okay. Fathers are necessary. Anybody else? Because I'm only hearing fathers are necessary, but for basically only one purpose, so I guess I is a one trick pony. I honestly was waiting to hear you guys say like fathers being the backbone of the household and no trick based on what we were just talking about. Yeah. And, and, and trust me, those are necessary and key components to raising successful, happy spiritual children. Because we, I, I, I'm going to tell, tell you all something. The thing about it is this, right? Well, Pete, Pete, me, Tyrone, all of we retired. And I, I honestly would have liked to stay retired. But, well, Lisa, he too. She says, Anna, that's on you. But the thing about it is this, right? I retired in 2016. But I was asked to come back to help out last year, November, which apparently keep going on and on and on. <laughs> what? Anyway. I'm going to be honest with you, the children that I left in 2016 are not the children that I come across in 2023. They are not the children that I came across in 2023. Because in every facet of their lives, when they are speaking with you and what they experience on a daily basis, it, it kind of shock you it kind of make you hold their hand and pray with them. Because trust me, and the majority of them come from homes without fathers. Just one little bit of one at one of my schools and we were talking and I was having a nice conversation when I, she, she was in one of the upper grades, I think grade six or five or something. And she said, I could ask you a question, Miss Jones. And I said, sure. She said, I think I'm bisexual. Sister Sony, that's exactly how I wanted to say it out loud. I said, really? And she said, yes. And she went into everything else, why she thinks she's how she is. And why she thinks she is so, and her whole household, and what was happening there. And all I'm going to say is that I think every morning, I am going to encourage every one of us, fathers and mothers here, to pray for our young people in our schools because they need a lot of parenting. They need prayers and parenting. They need fathers, strong fathers and strong mothers because they are going through a lot. They will smile, as she said to me. She said, I smile, but you don't know the hurt what, what was, I'm going through. I had another little one who also asked me if she could use my phone. She just turned seven. And she asked me if she could use my phone. I said, why? And she said, I want to call my father. I said, where is he? And she told me where he was. So I say, you have the number? She said, I have to ask my mommy for the number because he won't give it to her. He don't like my mommy and he don't talk to her. So then he don't talk to me. So I said, when was the last time you saw him? She said, like about two, three years ago. So I said, okay. I said, so he doesn't call you at all? She said, no. She said, and sometimes when I ask mommy about him, she gets vexed with me. And you know, she said, and you know my mommy gets angry a lot, you know. She gets very angry. I said, she does? She said, yes. She said, and when I don't behave and I don't listen? And then she proceeded to describe everything from the grabbing of the neck to the kicking to, the, to, to actually saying, I don't love you, I want to kill you, and I wish you were not here. 
And I believed her very much because guess what? The mother told me the same thing. Fatherless homes are a challenge. Children need their fathers. They need their fathers. I'm going to ask you to go back in your mind right now to the time that you had with your father. And I'm going to pick certain fathers. Just ask that question. No, you have to get up and you have to come up. Luti, you know I always started with you. Come on. Tell me a happy memory that you shared with Calco that you can remember. But I you have a mic for him. He's thinking back. Vali, you have a, tell me a happy memory you shared with Daddy. He do what? When he laid you, he laid you on the bus? <laughs> and that was special for you, right? He remembered with a smile. Did I see he smiling all now? Very good. Jay, you didn't know that, right? <laughs> all right. Brother Shushu Orien. That your dad ever said to you? He said so much? <laughs> Peter's thinking. Daddy, 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 daddy had this way of um, telling some exaggerating stories. <laughs> and so. He was describing this, this um, fat man, I think he saw in St. Thomas. And he said his waist was wide like the curtain from so to so. <laughs> Mommy said, Lord, boo. He said, doubt me. <laughs> <laughs> Not a curtain, but eight feet wide, you know. <laughs> yes, that's daddy. All right, let me see now. But it's Toby. What was the funniest thing? None of the funniest thing. Describe one thing that you would like to copy about your dad. Okay, definitely the family togetherness that he had. Mm. Um, I recall it, it would be on Sundays in particular. He would have the family together and he would cook. And he was a love. he was a chef. He was like the, the community chef. And he would make some lovely meals. And, you know, we really, and we really look forward for that. Um, similarly, on Saturdays, he would have us clean the yard and, you know, make, it, make, sure, that, make sure that we do our chores and so on. I didn't like that part <laughs> at the time. But I appreciated what he did. He had some issues, and I, you know, I admit he had some alcohol issues, and whenever he drank, he turned into something else. But I like to remember the positive part um, of him, and that is what I aspire to emulate. Thank you. But Asal. What was the most useful thing your father taught you, Brother Sal. And I remember Brother, Sal, Brother Sal's dad, our little child, and Luthi Sabinari. I know Luthi's going to say something about my age. I was a little child. I remember Brother <laughs> Sal's father sitting in the corner as he stepped in the church <laughs> on the left hand side. Okay. You ready? Yes, I'm ready. Now, one of the good things. As I really had love about my father, he had love to read. Mm -hmm. 
And I patronize that on to this day. He was a good father, a loving father. And he brought us up the way that God had wanted us to be brought up. And thank God for that. I can give God the thanks, the honor, the praise, and glory. Thank you very much for the cell. Brother Celio. He smiled. Why is your dad important to you? Just remember he right behind the cell. What list waiting for your answer? Uh, well, at this point, is he's a help to me and, and the family because he's home with my mom, you know what I'm And we are sort of out now, busy. Everybody have their own family. So he being there, that's, been, that's very, very, very important to us. But that's his wife, he's going to be there. <laughs> so tell me again now, why is he important to you? Well, it's important to me because of that. Because, I mean, at least he fell in Wait that. Wait a minute. If you don't do it, then you got to do it? Yes. Well, I mean, because I can't be there all the time. So it's important that, in that, that he is there. You understand? Okay. And that, all right. I mean, tell me how is he important to you personally. Like I said. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm not going to repeat myself. I mean, I said that, that's, a, that's real important for me. Real like for me. I'm like that's, that's really important for me. That's me, Celio. He being there to be with my mother, who I care about, and son, because I, I worry about her, her day and yet. night, mm -hmm. and he is there. I, at least he could take my phone, he could call somebody. Yeah, yeah. So he feel that. You know, good. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Celio. Now, there are lots of texts in the Bible that talks about the greatest father of all. Because as good a father as you think you are, we have the greatest father and the greatest example, yeah. which is our Lord and Savior, Jesus. God. Our God. God the Father. When we pray, we say, Oh, Father which art in heaven. The best example and the best father ever. Now, I'm going to ask any father, tell me a text without looking in the Bible that has to do with the father. Out of your head. Yes, Brother Celio. That has to do with the Father, yes. I didn't say it have to have in the word Father. I said it has to do with the Father. That's it, Brother Celio. What else? Well, only said, Oh, Father, we taught in heaven. In my father's house are many mansions. <laughs> in my father's house are many mansions. Who else? What other thing? Father, for. <laughs> father, for what not your children to write, whatever she should say. <laughs> Any other fathers? But a Benjamin, I ain't hearing from you. What do you say, Brother Benjamin? Father, forgive them. All right. Now, there are lots of texts. Proverbs 22, 6 says, Train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. Deuteronomy 6, 6 says, All these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when mm -hmm. you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. Luke 11, 11 to 13 says, You fathers, if your children ask for a fish, do you give them a snake instead? Or if they ask for an egg, do you give them a scorpion? Of course not. So if you send for people who know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Ephesians 6, 4, fathers do not provoke your children, like what the teacher said, to anger by the way you treat them. Rather, bring them up with the discipline and instruction that comes from the Lord. Now, but a prince, 
Come, Brother Prince, one minute, please. I think I'll give him the mic. Hello. After Brother Prince, I want Brother Benjamin. Come, Brother Benjamin. Right there. Brother Prince, tell me what makes you a great dad. That's a very good, very good and important question. Just a while ago, we heard the text quoted, it says, Father, Train up your children in the way they are to go, so that when they grow old, they will not depart from it. I can say today that I've um, looked at my father, listened to him, and I'm very, very happy to say that he set up um, a high role of training in my life. Amen. Now, my father had eight children. Um, the only one that looked just like him. <laughs> I'm the only one that walked in his footstep by going out house to house, do missionary work, and brought souls to the, to the, um, to, 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 with the help of God to, to Christ. Amen. Many, many souls he brought. And I'm the only one that walked in his footstep. Amen. So, the example that he set, it helped me to be the person that I am today, and I'm grateful. Amen. Thank you very much, Brother Prince. Brother Benjamin, what part of your life or character do you think you need to improve on as a father? <laughs> Getting up early and having prayer, really praying a lot. You need to pray more. That's one aspect that I think I need to improve on. Prayer. Prayer. Mm -hmm. You want to elaborate a little more? Just, just it? I see prayer is very powerful because, like you said, both of us um, were in the educational system and we see a lot of breakdown. And the children that we dealt with 10, 15 years ago are not the children we are dealing with today. Then so you have to really do a lot of praying, you have to be patient, you have to put yourself in their situation, which you can't at most of the time because you don't know what they're going through. And the only way we can get at wisdom and understanding to deal with things is by praying. Thank you. Pray. Don't move. Brother Elridge, come please. No, no, don't tell me you're going to see you walk up here faster than you, you're younger than see you. Right, so, so you see, they get a nice walk from. <laughs> All right, <laughs> you can go back up here. Yes. That's 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 the youngest senior citizen that I know. He and Brother Sal. So come come a little closer. All right, here, man. But I heard how you doing. You good? I believe so. All right. No, I'm looking at you, looking nice and sharp. You can tell he's a very up-to-date um, father, right? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes. <laughs> All right, so, so when you relate to your children and grandchildren, if I ask you, would you say that you are knowledgeable about 21st century stuff such as WhatsApp, YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, TikTok, any no. one of them? None of them. <laughs> none of them. None of them? You don't use none? None of them. So the first Brazilian will show you a picture of somebody on Facebook. They didn't show it to me. <laughs> <laughs> they say, you, you don't need it. No. What about WhatsApp? You know the WhatsApp on the phone, you can call your, 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 your family members and stuff like so. No. You don't need that. And those youth, by the way. <laughs> You, you use it, but you don't need it. Yeah, that's when the wife heard me. <laughs> when what? When the wife is talking, he called me, she showed me things. He said when the wife called him and talking, he showed him things. <laughs> All right, Brother Godfrey, Brother um, Elridge, don't move. Don't move. Yes, Brother Godfrey, come please. Oh. 
No, no, no. All right, don't move. I'm gonna take it from the mic, please. You can go now. Yes. Were you there, my friend? Yes. <laughs> but I got free. Yes, there. Do you believe that any child or young person can approach you and talk with you freely about topics that might affect them, such as sex, not believing in God, homosexuality, or even having a tattoo? Of course. <laughs> yes. Why do you say that? What makes you approachable? Well, because I only have one head like them. <laughs> Come, Sister Tammy. Approach but I got free. You, are you that? <laughs> Tell him that you think you're gay. <laughs> Go to him. <laughs> That's your grandfather. Tell, okay. him what you, tell him what you're going through. Good morning, Grandpa. Um, How are you? I'm good, thanks. Um, I have an issue that has been troubling me for the past couple of weeks. Well, for longer than a couple of weeks, but I think I know more now. Um, I think... I think I like the same sex. I, I, I think I'm gay. What do what you think about that? Um, I think that we are to think positive and truthful. When you stand in front of the mirror and you look at yourself and you look at your dad, do you see any difference? Answer the question, Sister Tammy. What do you say if, if, if when I look in the mirror, what? When you stand in front of the mirror and you look at yourself and you see your dad, do you see any difference? <laughs> if I see any difference? No. You have to have a difference because he's your dad. Right. Oh, you mean because you are a man and I'm a woman? Yes. Mm-hmm. Of course, the physical setup and the, the physique, they are different. You may change your mind, but the physic, you cannot change your physical look. You could think what you want to think, but that don't change the fact that what, who you are, you are, you are female. You are female. I a female, but suppose I like female. Well, um, what's up with that? I, I can't like a female? Of course you have to love your mother. <laughs> okay, Grandpa. Okay, Grandpa. I, I, I'm not sure if you understand where I'm coming from. Of course I love mommy. But I like like a female. Like, 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 like how you would, like a boy, like how you like mommy? Or, oh, I'm sorry, like how you like grandma? I like a female. Can that go? Listen. <laughs> the eternal, everlasting Father God who make men and women, he made a difference between them. Start counting your ribs and look at them. <laughs> and see if your ribs and the person who you like, 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 if I, if I ribs in the same way. Okay, Grandpa. Thank you so much for your advice. I will sit down and I will think about it some more. Sister Brenda Lee, he could hold a conversation. <laughs> I think we should finish there. <laughs> As you can see, Grandpa could really hold a conversation. Whatever you bring to him, he know exactly. And you know where that comes from? Being a father who believes in God, reads the word of God, and know what God expects so he could pass it on to the next generation. And this is what we expect of our fathers. 
Now, while no man has what it takes to accomplish his job as a father successfully, know that with God's help that you can get it done. All right? Time will prove whether or not you are a dedicated father or just a show father. Because the man who knows he can't do the job, he depends upon God's grace, like Brother Prince and Brother Godfrey saying. And despite his failings, then men know that he will qualify once he gets on his knees and asks God to guide and direct him. Thank you very much, Sabbath School members, and we are going to go into our lesson study right now. Prayers for lesson study, Brother Pete. Heavenly Father, as we turn to the study of your word, we ask that you may open up our minds, open up our understanding, dear Father, that we indeed, through the study of your word, may be able to understand more of what you're in, what you want for us, and what you want for our lives. Bless us and continue to be with us this holy Sabbath day and this Father's Day weekend in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Go to your lesson study classes or your classes of study. You know where they are.
is Pastor Mark Finley. He's an international speaker and evangelist. We're delighted to have him back once again. But before we look into this subject and get his thoughts on it, we are going to spend a moment in prayer. So join me if you want. Welcome to Sabbath School brought to you by It Is Written. We're glad that you could join us again this week as we continue our journey through the book of Revelation, especially looking at the three angels' messages. This is week number 12 of 13. So that means we've got one more week to cap everything off. But this week is a big one. We are looking at the seal of God and the mark of the beast part two, kind of picking up from where we left off last week. Our guest this week again is Pastor Mark Finley. He's an international speaker and evangelist. We're delighted to have him back once again. But before we look into this subject and get his thoughts on it, we are going to spend a moment in prayer. So join me if you would. Father, thank you so much for being with us along this journey as we've looked at the three angels' messages of Revelation. As we spend some time looking at another significant portion of that today, the seal of God and the mark of the beast, help us to understand it and to understand how it applies to us today in a very real way. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Pastor Mark, welcome back once again. Thank you. So last week we left off on an interesting subject. And interesting is probably not even as broad a, a, an adjective as I could use. But the seal of God and the mark of the beast, we looked at the identity of the beast power, the Antichrist, as it's often referred. We kind of dropped off the end there. And this week we pick up on the seal of God and the mark of the beast, part number two. Now, when we talk about the identity of the beast or the identity of the Antichrist, a lot of times people get this idea that it's uh, some world leader, some secular power or, or individually, a dictator, if you will. How do we know that the beast power is not some sort of a secular leader or power or dictator or something along those lines? I think one of the ways we know the answer to that question is by looking at Revelation 13 itself. Last week, we pointed out that Revelation 13 talks about the beast power rising after Babylon, after Medo-Persia, after Greece, after Rome, and that it would get its authority from pagan Rome. So we have to look back at the historical nature of the rise of the beast. So the beast rises not simply at end time, but the beast power is a power that has been present historically through history, and it rises out of pagan Rome, and we saw that papal Rome did. Secondly, the beast power in the book of Revelation is a power that the Bible says is a blasphemous power, and the Bible defines blasphemy as one claiming the authority or privileges or prerogatives as God's equal, and one in addition to that claiming the authority to, and the ability to forgive sin. So we see that it's a religious power, but there is a third identifying mark that I think comes to the very heart of your question. It's found in Revelation chapter 13, and it's found in verse 4. Revelation 13, verse 4, and would you like to read that, Pastor Eric? Sure, it says, So they worship the dragon who gave authority to the beast, and they worship the beast, saying, Who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? So whoever this beast power is, it is he, the beast power is one that compels worship. It, it, so you have to have a worshiping power. This is not some business person that rises. Mm -hmm. I will not name any who have been suggested because <laughs> I don't want to put any ideas in people's heads. But uh, it's not some business leader that rises. It's not some political leader that rises. It's a power that grew out of Rome. It's a system, not an individual. So just like, for example, in Daniel, where it talks about the lion, the bear, the leopard, the dragon. 
in Daniel 7, verse 17, it says, these beasts which are four are four kings or kingdoms that arise out of the earth. So Babylon was not simply Nebuchadnezzar, it was the kingdom of Babylon. The lion was not simply Nebuchadnezzar, it was the kingdom of Babylon. The bear wasn't Cyrus or Darius, it was the kingdom of Medo-Persia. The leopard wasn't Alexander, it was the kingdom of Greece. And the same with the Rome. Uh, you know, it's, it's not simply a Herod or a Caesar, it is rather the kingdom. So this is talking about a system that would grow out of Rome, a system of religious worship, a system of a leader that would claim the authority of God. So we can know that. Also, there's some interesting mathematical proof about the duration of its reign. So, so talk a little bit about that mathematical proof. Where do we find that? And uh, I'm looking here at, at verse number five. It says it was given authority for 42 months. I'm guessing that might be part of the mathematical uh, element of this, but uh, un unlock, unpack a little bit more of that, that mathematical element. So the authority of 42 months. Now remember, in Bible prophecy, one prophetic day equals one literal year. When you look, for example, at um, the prophecies in Daniel that talk about this same power. You have the Antichrist mentioned in Thessalonians by Paul. You have the little horn power mentioned by Daniel. You have the beast power mentioned by Revelation, but the identification, identifying marks of these powers are all the same. So let's go back to Daniel chapter 7 and verse 25. Daniel 7 verse 25. We've read 42 months. We're going to go to two or three other Bible passages. And we'll go to Daniel 7, verse 25. And uh, go ahead and read those, Pastor. Sure. Daniel 7, 25 says, He shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High, and shall intend to change times and law. Then the saint shall be given into his hand for a time and times and half a time. Notice this power would intend to think that they had the ability to change times and law. Well, the only law that has to do with time is the Sabbath commandment. And if the central issue in the book of Revelation and Daniel is worship and who and how do you worship, the Sabbath commandment is the one that speaks of worship. If the central issue is one of authority, the Sabbath commandment gives you the authority for the whole law. It talks about who gave the law, the creator God, and, and it talks about why we worship God and, and his title. We're going to look at that later when we talk about the seal of God. But notice here it says that, that this power that would attempt to change the law of God would reign for a time, times, and half a time. 42 months, time, times, and half a time. What's all that about? Let's now go to Revelation chapter 12. This will bring things home to us. Revelation chapter 12, and we're going to look here at verse 6 and verse 14. Revelation 12, verse 6 and verse 14. So go ahead and read verse 6 and 14. Verse 6 says, Then the woman fled into the wilderness, where she has a place prepared by God, that they should feed her there 1,260 days. Then over in verse 14 it says, but the woman was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness to her place where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the presence of the serpent. 42 months, 1260 days, time, time, and half a time. In the Jewish calendar, there were 30 days in a month. So if you look at 30 times 42, it's 1260. Here you got 1260. Time, many translations say year, two years, half a year, three and a half prophetic years, 42 months, 1260 days. So if a, if a prophetic day equals a year, you've got 1260 years, 42 months, 1260 days, 1260 years. Babylon reigned, then Medo Persia, then Greece, then Rome. The Roman Empire fell apart from about 351 AD to 476 AD. By 538 AD, the papal power was the dominant power in Europe. The pagan Roman emperor, Justinian, gave to Vigilus II, the Pope of Rome, the civil and religious authority. So the 1260 years would have begun in 538. 1798, 
Berthier, the French general, looks down and he takes the Pope captive and brings the Pope into captivity. So the amazing thing is that mathematically the papal power fits into this prophecy remarkably. Let's look at these four identifying characteristics. The papal power receives its authority from pagan Rome. The papal power is a worldwide system of worship, Revelation 13, 5. The papal power claims the authority of God to forgive sin. The papal power reigned for 1260 years. So here are some very clear historical facts that identify the papacy as a system of religious power that rises in Revelation chapter 13. Pastor Mark, you mentioned that in 1798, Napoleon's general Berthier took the Pope into captivity. Here in the lesson on Sunday, you mentioned a deadly wound. How are these things related one to another? Sure. In Revelation chapter 13, if you let your eyes drop down to a couple passages in Revelation 13, verse 3, Revelation 13, 3, and I saw one of his heads as it had been mortally wounded and his deadly wound was healed and all the world marveled after the beast. So, uh, and then if you go down further to um, the uh, ninth verse, go ahead and pick up verse nine. Verse nine says, if anyone has an ear, let him hear. He who leads into captivity shall go into captivity. He who kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. So this deadly wound would occur. Napoleon is in the north. He's in France. He looks down to Italy. He sees a dominant rival to him sends Berthier down, he goes down in 1797, but pulls back, well, another general goes down in 1797, but Berthier comes down in 1798, takes the Pope captive, he goes up to Valencia in France, and um, he dies there in captivity. So it's a direct fulfillment of this prophecy, exactly at the end of the 1260 years, exactly as the Bible says, exactly in the way that he says the deadly wound takes place. Interestingly enough, in 1928, Mussolini gives civil and religious authority back to the Pope, and uh, in the San Francisco Chronicle, it says, deadly wound is healed. So these prophecies, prophecy does not guess, it knows. They've been fulfilled exactly. And so we're seeing evidence after evidence after evidence that the identification that that we have been studying here uh, over the last couple of weeks In fact, the identification that many Protestant scholars over the years have made is is accurate. Mm -hmm. Um, There are some fanciful ideas of, like you said, political and business leaders today uh, fulfilling these, but um, you can't fit everything in in those individuals. Uh, Any other thoughts on this before we go to break? I do. I have one thought on it, and it it is this. Um, If you look at the reformers, you look at Martin Luther, for example, he saw in the Antichrist, in the little horn power, in the beast power, he saw the papacy. You look at the Protestant, great Protestant reformers, uh, John Wycliffe, Huss, Jerome, all of these men saw in these prophecies the prediction of the rise of the papacy that would substitute tradition for truth, substitute the commandments of men for the commandments of God. Again, this is not speaking about individuals, but we're looking at a system. This is not some Johnny-come-lately, pull a rabbit out of a hat, you know, uh, trick. Not at all. It is rather the clear historical chain of truth outlined in Scripture one more powerful evidence that we can indeed believe the Bible. I want to encourage you, as you're studying the Bible and getting to know it better, make sure that you pick up the companion book to this quarter's lesson. It is called Three Cosmic Messages by Pastor Mark Finley, and you will find it at itiswritten.shop. It goes into more detail on the subject that we're looking at today, as well as many other subjects that we have covered. Itiswritten.shop, Three Cosmic Messages by Pastor Mark Finley. In just a moment, we will come back and we're going to be looking at, you know, the, the one that gets all the, the flash and the fanfare is the mark of the beast. The one that often gets overlooked is the contrast to the mark of the beast, and that is the seal of God. And we're going to be delving into that in just a moment. We'll see you back momentarily. There's nothing like a great dad. 
Great dads influence their children, protect and grow their families, and contribute to society. But the truth is, not every dad is a great dad. There are plenty of average dads. And, sad but true, there's no shortage of bad dads. Bad dads are found all through the Bible, God preserving their stories so we can avoid making the same mistakes they made. Don't miss Bad Dads and What They Teach Us. Learn from the failings of some of the most illustrious people in biblical history, people who managed to make a mess of parenting. There's hope for every parent who doesn't always get it right. And that's because the best dad of all wants to see parents be all that they can be. Bad Dads and What They Teach Us, brought to you by It Is Written TV. You know that at It Is Written, we are serious about studying the Word of God, and we encourage you to be serious as well. Well, here's what you do if you want to dig deeper into God's Word. Go to itiswritten.study for the It Is Written Bible Study Guides online. 25 in-depth Bible studies that will take you through the major teachings of the Bible. You'll be blessed, and it's something you'll want to tell others about as well. Itiswritten.study. Go further. Itiswritten.study. Welcome back to Sabbath School, brought to you by It Is Written. We are looking at a fascinating subject this week. That is the seal of God and the mark of the beast. Pastor Mark, we kind of, we left off on asking, what is the seal of God? First of all, where do we read about the seal of God in the, in the book of Revelation? Where do we find it? We find it in Revelation chapter 7, verses 1 to 3, where it says, After these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth holding the four winds of the earth. Now, wind is a symbol of destruction. The four corners of the earth, the, the four points of the compass, north, south, east, west, that the wind, that is the wind of destruction through the seven last plagues, should not blow on the earth, on the sea, or in any tree. Then I saw another angel from the east having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea, saying, do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees till we've sealed the servants of God in their foreheads. So we find that concept of the seal of God in the light of the coming of Christ just before the seven last plagues here in Revelation chapter 7. We find the seal of God in contrast to the mark of the beast. So if it's going to play a role shortly before the seven last plagues, shortly before Jesus comes back, that would indicate that it's going to be playing a significant role very, very soon. Exactly. In fact, in these messages of the three angels, that's why God has given this urgent message to mankind. And we read in Revelation 14, could you read verse 7, then verse 9, and then verse 12? Verse 7 says, Saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. Verse nine says, then a third angel followed them saying with a loud voice, if anyone worships the beast in his image and receives his mark on his forehead or in his hand, verse 10 talks about what's going to happen to them. And then verse number 12 says, here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Notice the contrasts. Worship the creator, verse seven, don't worship the beast, verse 9, and then keep the commandments of God. So the final conflict regarding the mark of the beast and the seal of God is over worship. This final conflict focuses on worshiping the creator and worshiping the beast. So worshiping the creator must be in total harmony with the commandments. So what commandment has to do with worshiping the creator? The Sabbath. So the question becomes then, is the Sabbath the seal, the visible symbol of the seal of God? Mm. See, if somebody asks me, what is the seal of God? It is a settling into God's truth, spiritually and intellectually, so you can never be moved. But the visible manifestation of that settling into God's truth at a time when an economic boycott is passed and a death decree is passed, the visible manifestation of the inner commitment is the external keeping of the Sabbath. So do we find the seal of God in the Sabbath commandment? Well, let's go back and look at Exodus chapter 20. 
And I'll talk a little bit about ancient seals. What was an ancient seal used for? An ancient seal authenticated a legal document. So if there was a legal document in ancient times, they would have a seal. Many thousands of seals were, have been discovered by the archaeologists. These seals would uh, have the name of the sealer, typically some of them would, or the symbol of the sealer. They would have the title of the sealer. They would have the territory. But there would be something that indicated name, title, and, and territory of the sealer. They, they often wouldn't have the exact name, but the, the seal would indicate the authority, the one who has the authority to make that seal. The key thing about a seal is that they authenticate a legal document and they have to declare who is the one who has the authority to authenticate that document. The Ten Commandments were written by God on tables of stone with his own finger. Has he authenticated that document and how has he? Well, let's look at Exodus chapter 20 and um, why don't you read, just write down 8 through 11, okay? Verse 8 says, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you nor your son nor your daughter nor your male servant nor your female servant nor your cattle nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Now let's look at that carefully. It says, remember the Sabbath day. God said, remember, but human beings have forgotten. He wrote these commandments with his own finger on tables of stone. He says, six days you shall labor, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. There's his name. He's the Lord your God. Then it goes on to say about doing no work therein, and he says, for in six days, verse 11, the Lord made heavens and earth, the sea and all that in them is. The Lord made. He's a maker or creator. That's his title. He's the maker. And here's his domain, heaven, earth, sea, and all that in them is. He rested the Sabbath, the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. In the Sabbath commandment, you have the name of God, the Lord my God. You have the title, his creator, and you have his domain, heaven, earth, and sea. So the Sabbath commandment contains the seal of God. Just like in the days of Daniel, when they, Nebuchadnezzar built the golden image, that the second commandment was a test question. It revealed an inner faith. Just like the first commandment in the days of Daniel when he was threatened not to pray to any god except the king Darius and he went into the lion's den. Just like Daniel himself had that faith, the second commandment was a visible external manifestation of that inner faith. The Sabbath commandment, worshiping the Creator at the climax of verse history, is a visible manifestation of genuine, authentic faith in God. And keeping the Sabbath is not a legalistic form of salvation, but it is a revelation of the faith of Christ at a time of crisis. Now, if the seal of God indeed is the Sabbath, and if there's a test over the law of God, how might we look at this conflict between the seal of God and the mark of the beast? So it seems that the mark of the beast would have to stand in contrast to it. It if, would. If the manifestation of, of settling into the truth for God is, is the recognition and the practice of keeping the Sabbath, then the flip side would have to, to be the mark of the beast. Exactly. You know, here there's a couple things that I think, a couple statements that are quite critical. Um, if you look, for example, on page 100 of the quarterly, there's a statement from the book Great Controversy, page 592. Is that one that you have you could read? It is. It says, those who honor the Bible Sabbath will be denounced as enemies of law and order, as breaking down the moral restraints of society, causing anarchy and corruption, and calling down the judgments of God upon the earth. Their conscientious scruples will be pronounced obstinacy, stubbornness, and contempt of authority. They will be accused of disaffection toward the government. That's a pretty serious statement. Mm. Now, 
How does that play into the mark of the beast and what might the mark of the beast is? Why are they being uh, claimed as enemies of law and order? Could it be that the opposite of Sabbath worship is sun worship coming back into the church, like in the days of Constantine? Could it be that the mark of the beast is the mark of the papal power uniting with the state and the economic leaders at a time of crisis to initiate laws to worship on Sunday at a time the world's falling apart? In the American Catholic Quarterly Review, January 1883, I'm reading a statement that says, of course the Catholic Church claims that the change, that's the change of the Sabbath was her act, and the act is a mark of her ecclesiastical power and authority in religious matters. So the Church says that the change of the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday is a mark of her ecclesiastical authority. Well, if you change the law of God written with God's own finger on tables of stone, you must have an authority greater than God. Nobody does that has an authority greater than God. He is the highest authority. There are those that say it's impossible, for example, that um, Sunday would ever become a common day of rest and worship. It's very interesting. On June 6, 2012, and I've listed this in the quarterly, Pope Benedict XVI made an urgent appeal to more than 15,000 people gathered at St. Peter's Square in Rome. And he said Sunday must be a day of rest for everyone. And he goes on to say by defending Sunday, one defends human freedom. Now, this isn't, of course, calling for Sunday legislation, but what it is saying is that it's, it's preparing the way for that. It's saying, look, Sunday is a day for, for workers to rest. It's a day for social opportunity with our family. It's a day for shops to be closed. The mind is being conditioned to accept this Sunday in the future. In fact, in Europe, there is a movement right now, today, uh, in some places in Europe, there's a movement to have Sunday as a day of rest for laborers, not so much a worship day because Europe is quite secular, but you can see at a time of crisis, at a time of earthquake, famine, fire, flood, war, threat of nuclear war, it might be possible for these prophecies to be fulfilled. I think it's highly likely that they could. Yeah, I think we're getting closer and closer to that. And if you're paying attention to what's happening in the world around you, and I hope that you are, and if you're paying attention to what the Bible says is happening right now and will be happening in the near future, you're aware of some of the things that are shortly going to come to pass on this uh, earth. And it has been very interesting to look at what's happening in the news, especially in Europe, with some of these things. But God has not left us to be ignorant of what's happening. He gives us plenty of opportunity to know what's going on and to prepare for what's going on. It's not just a matter of a day. It's a matter of something much deeper, and that's of heart and loyalty. And what God is doing today is he's calling people to trust him, to believe in him, to have faith in him, and to walk forward in the truth that he has shown them. And my hope and prayer is that God is encouraging you to do the very same thing. Pastor Mark, thank you for joining us thank again you. this week. And thank you for joining us. Next week, we will get together again for our final time this quarter as we pull together the last thoughts on three cosmic messages. God bless you, and we'll see you next week. Hello everyone, it's Anfernita. Today's story is called Swim, Climb, and Fly. Today's memory verse is from Revelation chapter 22, verse 1. It says, The angel showed me the river of the water of life, as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and the Lamb. Today's message 
is God has prepared wonderful things for us to enjoy throughout eternity. When you have been outside on a hot day, a big, cool glass of water tastes wonderful. Now, read about a river whose clear water gives life to all who drink it. Remember Adam and the great family reunion in heaven? Jesus gave Adam a piece of fruit from the tree one of life. Minute. That was just one of 12 different kinds that grow on the tree. Unlike trees on earth, minute, the tree sir. of life gives a different fruit every month. The minute. leaves are useful too. The Bible says the leaves help heal all who have joined Jesus in heaven. This wonderful tree grows on each side of the river of life. The river of life runs right down the middle of a golden street. The river water is as clear as crystal. We can see all the way to the bottom. It flows from the throne of God. We can eat fruit from the tree of life and drink water from the river of life forever. The river will never dry up. The tree will never die. God and Jesus sit on their thrones in heaven. We can talk to them face to face. We can visit them at any time because there is no night. No night means there's no darkness. The light from God's glory makes everything bright. We won't need lamps or right. candles Thank or even the sun. Teachers. And we will never get tired. We won't have to take naps or even go to bed. Every minute in heaven is like morning. We will spend some of our time learning new things, no, yes, but lovely. not in the same way as on earth. Our brains will be perfect so we understand and remember well. Jesus will teach us new things. We will do First, I want to thank the, the, the fathers. We see so many fathers here now. We want to thank you for gracing us with your presence. And we want to thank the fathers that, that participated so ably before in the Sabbath school. We saw some fathers that came in a little late. Um, not late, late, but they came in afterwards. So we just want to get you into it a little bit. Um, before I close off. We asked all some of our fathers some question, some questions, but we're gonna get a little see that in the background. Our fathers are being seated in the back, so we're just accommodating them. This morning we were talking about the qualities of fathers and what it takes to make a wonderful father. And we asked the father some questions. But I saved three questions because I want to ask the father some questions this morning. And the last three questions that I'm going to ask are Brother Nigel, Brother Chad, and Brother Neddy. Brother Nigel, Brother Chad, and Brother Neddy. Can I have a call this mic, please? First question, Brother Chad, come. Yeah, right by me. Can you hear some hand here the mic, please? See how distinguished she looks? We had some very informed answers and truthful answers from parents, so we're continuing the thread right now. But a chat. Do you believe in corporal or physical punishment? Both. So you believe trends should get licks? Yeah. Why? You put, you put a fair guard in them? <laughs> Explain a little more, please. As a child, you don't want to get licks. So all you have to do is lick a child properly one time, you, and if threat of the licks, go and stop them from doing anything the second, third, fourth, and fifth time. Okay, so, 
Okay, so how he, he say you gonna lick? He say you gonna lick them properly. How do you lick them properly? You got a proper way to lick them? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You tell, oh, the abuse. You, no, you tell them pour them hand. You lick them with a belt, too hard strap. That's it. That's it. But you gotta do it from young. Tell me, I could tell you. Kay, when when Kaylee was a, a baby, I tell them because she gonna get her first licks. All the training gonna get them first licks when them two years old. They ain't gonna get licked before two, but when you reach two, you should know better. So you gonna get licked at two. When she reached two, she used to cuckoo herself. She'll go in the corner, hide, cuckoo, Kaylee, look your party there. She used to cuckoo still. So she's a willful? Yeah. So one day, Tamika asked her if she want cuckoo. She said no. She went in her bedroom, stood down in her corner, cuckoo, in her pamper. She come out, I hit her two belt. From that day on, she cuckoo in her party. Daddy look like cuckoo in my party. Daddy look like cuckoo in my party. She don't want to get no more licks. Problem solved. <laughs> Thank you very much for the chat. <laughs> but Aneti, come please. You hear that problem solved? But Aneti, tell me something that you did with your children that you loved and what you did with them that they did not like. Something that I did with them that I love. Mm -hmm. And something you did with them that they did not like. I love when we take them out. Um, Put them out. When Nurse and I take them on the beach. When we take them on the beach and what I like to do is um, roast breadfruit with them. You know, like set the fire and get the whole kind of... A little louder. The, out the outdoor activity of you know, roasting the breadfruit and stuff. Um, our next thing that I used to love doing with them since we moved from Caribbean, we haven't done in a while, is um, snorkeling. Snorkeling? Yeah. OK. Now, now what do you do with them that they don't like? That means they like everything you do with them? No, no. I try, I, I'm trying to think of something that they don't like. Navarro, Navarro, come in. Come there, come there. <laughs> what, 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 you do? What do you do with your father? You and your father do that, that you that really you don't, don't like, like, but you just do because he's your father. Walk. Walk? <laughs> yeah, okay, I, I, I can see that. He didn't even, he didn't even think about it. That's true. He said, walk. I, I, I can see that. The, the stuff at, the stuff that I do at work. I don't yeah. hate it, but it's like indifferent. Put, give him the mic, let say. I don't, I don't hate it, but I'm indifferent to it because it's not like my, my career path, what I want to do. Not it, following it, but. So it's boring? It's not boring. But it's just not you? Yeah. Okay. So you only did it one time, you know, right? No, I do it. You do it all the time? Yeah, constantly. Okay. Yeah. All right. See, he still do it. Brother Nigel. Where's Brother Nigel? In, in other words, Brother Nigel, run. Come, Brother Nigel. Come, Brother Nigel. Come. Come, Brother Nigel. He, he tell me he got to run call somebody else. All right. So I'm going to call our last father. We have so much nice fathers down there. Brother Mario. <laughs> Now, fathers, it's your day. We have to use you. But Elaine, come please. Using everyday words such as happy, or cheap, or nice, or kind. If you were not in a room, how would your children describe you? If I were not in the room? Yes. I don't know. How, how do you think they would describe you? I could go ask them now. How I think they would describe me. 
A workaholic. Okay. That's what they were describing me. A workaholic. They always say, I can't go sit on, I won't stop. And that's why I think. Always going. Always going. Okay. That's good or bad? I think it's good. <laughs> Don, that's good or bad? She ain't here. I know she is. She outside. She can't hear. Next question. <laughs> Don. Don. I asked him what words his children would use to describe him if he, if he was not in the room. And he said workaholic. Any other word? <laughs> Are there others? Oh, yes. Hard working, loving. She's a spoil. I said she's hard working and she's kind, she's loving. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, from the children's point of view. From a children's point of view. Excellent. If I'm hard working, yeah. Loving, yeah. What did she say? Kind, kind I think so. What else? Okay, my little G out there. Well, yeah, because I actually do. I believe. <laughs> he said he believed. Thank you, Brother Lynn. All right. All right. Now, before we go to our um, mission story, fathers, we have a special treat for you. Miss John is going to bless us with special music. I could ask Nima, you know.
Thank you very much, Sister Sharia John, for a beautiful, beautiful and blessed item of music. She was lovely, wasn't she? Yeah. She could play all through the whole service for me, trust me. I enjoyed it tremendously. Good morning, everyone. Happy Sabbath. We can all agree that we had a wonderful program so far. And the, the pleasure is mine to welcome all of you to wish you a warm Sabbath school welcome today as we the women celebrate the fathers. A very special welcome is extended to all of you fathers. Thank you for coming and we hope that you enjoy the program thus far. We will now go into our mission story and it's entitled Mysterious Man on a Bicycle and it's taken out of Portugal. Vera gave Bible studies to an elderly couple, Anna and Pedro, who couldn't read or write. The couple's son, Ben Vendo, helped with the Bible studies. He read the Bible verses aloud to them and they wrote out their answers. No Seventh-day Adventist lived in the remote town of 100 people in central Portugal. The town's people were simp simple and honest and had never traveled beyond the nearest town, which was quite some distance away. Vera was sent to the, to the town to work as a missionary for a year. Anna and Pedro were well over 70 years. Something about them caught Vera's attention. When the Bible study examined the Sabbath, Anna readily accepted the biblical teaching that the Sabbath is on the seventh day of the week. Yes, yes, I know, that's true, she said. Vera was surprised. People in the village tended to cling to their traditional beliefs, but Vera didn't say anything. A week later, the Bible study turned to the topic of clean and unclean meat in Leviticus 11. Yes, I know that's true, Anna said. Vera's surprise grew. She couldn't remain silent. How do you know that's true? She asked. Anna explained that more than 60 years earlier, when she was a young girl, a man had arrived in her town on a bicycle on a Sabbath afternoon. The visitor had made his way to the town central square and preached to whoever would listen. Among those who listened, was Anna's father. He listened and went home afterwards to look in his own Bible to see if the man had spoken the truth. Unlike his daughter, he knew how to read. The man on the bicycle came Sabbath after Sabbath. Anna's father listened every Sabbath and compared what he heard with what his Bible said. He saw that the man preached only Bible truths. He told young Anna many times, no, the seventh day is the Sabbath. You know we shouldn't eat unclean meat. Vera was amazed to hear about the Adventist preacher. Because of his preaching, many decades earlier, she didn't need to convince Anna about anything from the Bible. Anna knew that what, would she, that what she was hearing was the truth, because she had heard the same truth from her father. The Bible studies with Vera simply confirm her father's words. Vera was humbled by the experience. She felt like Jesus was telling her, the saying is true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you have not labored. Others have labored and you have entered into their labors. And that's from John 4, 37 to 38. Vera got to see Anna and Pedro baptized because of the sermons preached by an unknown man many years earlier. The couple's son, Ben Vendo, also was baptized. Vera had never forgotten Anna and Pedro. Those Bible studies took place at the beginning of her work as a missionary, and the experience strengthened her faith. Wherever she works as a missionary, she's not worried 
about whether she sees immediate results. Her job is to sow the seed and to trust the results to God. I look forward to meeting the man on a bicycle in heaven, Vera says. I will tell him, look, the work that you have done was not in vain. See these people who were baptized because of you? Education, including Bible studies in unreached towns, is a major way that the Seventh-day Adventist Church shares the good news about Jesus' soon coming in Portugal. Part of this quarter's 13th Sabbath offering, which will be collected next Sabbath, will help expand Adventist education by opening an elementary school in Setubal, Portugal. Thank you for planning a generous Sabbath school offering. And thank you for listening to this morning's mission story. Thank you very much, Sister Tamika. In conclusion of our Sabbath school, if you didn't have a father around, or if you are a single mother, God promises to be a father to the fatherless. Psalms 68.5. Now don't let statistics make you think a situation is hopeless. No situation is hopeless with God. Let me repeat it. No situation is hopeless with God. He has a great plan for you and your family. If you are a father, take what God's word says and make that your aim for fatherhood. God has set the standard and all you need to do is follow his example. Who needs fathers? We all do. We especially need our father who is in heaven, who forgives our parenting inadequacies for Jesus' sake, and who enables us each day with a fresh start. And just as the loving father in Luke's gospel welcomed home his last son, our father will one day welcome us into heaven together with all others who love and trust in Jesus. It is said that when we die, we take nothing with us to heaven. But as the saving faith is shared from generation to generation, our gracious Father will bring both us and our children to live forever at the foot of his eternal throne. Now, fathers, before we close Sabbath school, we have a little token from the Sabbath school for you, and I especially want to say thank you to Sister Monique and Sister Linda and sister, my three sisters right there. All right, thank you so much.
Praise the Lord. God is good. And all the time, God is good. Now, listen up here very carefully. Our mission statement says to make mature and multiply believers for? For when? Eternity. Okay. And it says our vision statement is what? Every member in mission and Ministry for whom? We have been saying this every Sabbath now. But we want to put it into action. Amen? Amen. So when are we going to put this into action? Hmm? No. Amen. The Bible says today is a day of salvation if you do what? If you hear his voice, do what? Harden not your hearts. No. The time has come for God's people to do what? To go out and evangelize and tell the world that Jesus is doing what? Coming. coming soon. The only way that men and women, boys and girls, will know that Jesus is coming is by we doing what? Going and telling because he gave us that commission to do what? To go. And we have to go. We've been sitting too long now. Amen? So we have to get up. Just like exercise, we have to really get those muscles tuned and get going. So we're going to be doing that next Sabbath, the 24th. We want to have a powerful outreach program, bedroom, And we have to make some sacrifice. Because who made the most ultimate sacrifice for us? Jesus did. He gave up all glory. And he came to be spat upon, to be ridiculed, to be hungry, to be homeless, to do what for us? 
to give us hope, to give us eternal life. And just a small, minute thing he wants us to do, to tell someone that he died for them. And we are going to do just that. Amen? Amen. Now, we want to go out as a church. We're going to have a powerful, evangelistic, dynamic preaching by our pastor. We'll be introducing the pastors to the community next week, and we want everybody to be there. We want to start the ball rolling by telling people that Jesus is coming soon. He is coming soon. And we have a powerful outreach program in place for the church. But the only way that that can be possible is by we as a church living up to our commitment that we have been saying every Sabbath. And we want to live up to that commitment to go out and tell somebody and tell somebody. Amen? Amen. So next Sabbath, you'll be hearing more, I guess, in the chat on Sunday night and Wednesday night. But more so now, we're going to have early morning service. Amen? Amen. Now 6 o'clock, the sun is up. Right? Or somebody said 5 o'clock is sun up. So you have no excuse to get up out of your bed early. We have service here at 6 a.m. next Sabbath morning. Amen? Amen? Early morning service, we are revived. You're feeling that nice, fresh air, that nice breeze coming in. And we're going to worship God in the beauty of holiness. So our program is going to be from 6 a.m. to 9 a.m. regular church service. Then we're going to have um, a half an hour break whereby we're going to, since you've been coming from home so early, we're going to have some refreshment to revive you to do what? To go out into the field. We want to go out into the field. Now, this is what we are going to be doing. We want to go out into the field and pull every family member in our community and say, listen, we want to pray with you as an Adventist church here, the Caribbean Adventist church members. We want to pray with you. As family, you're going to ask them what are some specific needs you have. And people are going to open up to you. You're going to pray with them. And you're going to invite them out to our, fo- to our program in the afternoon at 5 o'clock. Right here, sir, by um, the park right there. Right up there, so across from Brother Francis' house. That's where the program is going to be. Church, we have to get up and get going. Also, on top of that, coming in September, we have a crusade. Our pastor is going to have an evangelistic series crusade right up here in Carroll Bay, amen? Or it might be in Apple Bay, whichever direction, but it's going to be in our community. And the only way that it can be successful is by we attracting a crowd to come. We cannot stay home and expect people to come. We have to attract them. We have to tell them. And that is the only way these things will be successful. So we are dependent on you, brethren, to come out next Sabbath, 6 o'clock. Have fellowship here with us. We're going to take a little refreshing break, half an hour. And by 10 o'clock, after we get ourselves organized, we're going to be going out into the fields, going to Carrot Bay, going as far as probably Ballast Bay, King Garden Bay, going to West End, going to Tower French Monsky. We have our classes already in place, and we're going to go by classes. Amen? Amen? Yes, we want everybody to participate. So we're going to be praying with families. We are going to be sharing out our priorities, the, 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 our, our monthly paper, whereby we can read something about the love of Christ and what Christ has in store for people. We're going to be sharing those out. We're going to be telling them about our outreach program. And this is what we'll be doing from now on to every first Sabbath. We're going to have programs in place whereby we go out into the community because we have a good series coming up, whereby we have a crusade coming up to pull men and women, boys and girls, out of the world of Babylon and into God's remnant church. Amen? But we have to start the groundwork from now. That is the only way that that's going to work. So we are dependent on the church members. We are dependent on you to come out and make this program a success. So we will come. We will go. Amen? Yes. Let us make that sacrifice and go somewhere. You come to church, but get some, something comfortable, some real nice comfortable shoes to put on, ladies, whereby we can go out into the community. Now, to make our little refresher successful, if you can in some way or the other contribute, whereby you can some fruits or you want to do something real tasty, whereby you can give our members, that would be very much appreciated. 
So you can see myself or Sister Limpy or any of the community service team. We want to make this a success. The only way it can be successful is by us as a church participating, every one of us. Amen? So let us have a word of prayer. Let us stand. Let us everybody stand, please. Let us have a word of prayer because we're going to go out by faith, believing that God has the work for us to do, and we're going to go forward and do what he says to do. Amen? Amen. 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 Let us pray. Lord, we want to thank you for your matchless love. We want to thank you for your sustaining grace. As we are about to embark on your mission, Lord, I pray that you may send your Holy Spirit upon each member here today, that we may get up out of our seats, get up out of our beds, get up out of where we are sitting for so long, and move out by faith into our community, letting men and women know, boys and girls, that your coming is even at the door, and they need to accept you as Savior and Lord of their life. Bless our efforts, Lord, and make all these programs a success. Because we ask all these things by faith in your wonderful matchless name. Amen and amen. You may be seated. Good morning again, church. We are here to celebrate with our men today for our Sabbath program. But of course, a staple in our church service for those who are visiting from all other areas, I see some of our fellow church members from um, Sweet Redemptive and so forth. Every Sabbath, we talk about our church building project. And if you've not seen it before, hopefully they'll put some pictures up on the screen so you can get a first-hand view as to what's happening in Carrot Bay. So we've been worshiping at this youth center, I think, since 2017. 2017. And I don't know about y'all, but I, I tired of being here now. Y'all tired? Yes. yes. We're ready to go to our tabernacle, to our sanctuary. And we can only get there if we all make the sacrifice to give of our time, to give of our funds, or efforts, to make sure that we can get that building completed. So we're making some strides. I don't see the photos up yet. But today, as always, we're making a drive to... Solicit from you, our visitors, our regular members, your donations towards our church building project. Now, we've done penny drives, nickel drive, dime drive, quarter drives, check drives. We've done steel drives. We've done block drives, birthday drives. That's true. We've done all sorts. But today, I just want you to go in your pockets and take out whatever is in the post. So, Helen, when you dig in your purse today, whatever is in the purse, don't leave with it. You have to leave it here today. Okay? So, this drive is about emptying your wallets. Empty your purse. If you only have coins, whatever is in your purse today has to go in our donation buckets. Sister Clearly and somebody else. Can I see? Sister Carlotta. So, the hats. Our able ladies are going to be collecting. Remember now, this drive is about emptying your purse and your wallets of whatever you have. Okay? So our drive today, we're going to trust God and we're going to see him multiply whatever we have. So even if you had it for another bill, trust that God is going to see you and provide for you today even in this sacrifice. So we're going to sing that song. We give a sacrifice of praise unto the Lord. We bring a sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord. We bring a sacrifice of praise. You're making a sacrifice into the house of the Lord. And we offer up. And we offer up to you a sacrifices of thanksgiving. And we offer up to you the sacrifices of praise. We give a sacrifice. We bring a sacrifice of praise. Into the house of the Lord, we bring a sacrifice of praise into 
the house of the Lord and we offer up to you the sacrifices of thanksgiving and we offer up to you the sacrifices of praise so we know that those who've made that sacrifice, who've went, gone down in the post, the deep corners where you push that $50 just in case, or that $100 in a little crevice, I know all us ladies do that. We're putting in that into the sacrifice for today, and we're going to see God multiply and bless whatever you had that money for. He's going to provide it for you, and you're going to use next week to testify of how good God has been even with your sacrifice. So let's pray for the sacrifices that have been made today as we continue to build God's sanctuary. Father God, we're so grateful to you for your love, for your mercies, and for the opportunity to give a sacrifice of praise. We ask, oh God, that those of us who have done, dug deeply in our pockets and have put forward what we have in our purses, Lord, we ask that you would bless it, help it to go to the furtherance of your work, but more so, Lord, help this opportunity to help us to see, Lord, that you continue to provide for your children, and even the sacrifices we've made to put aside our own needs for your work, Lord, will be done to your name's honor and glory. Thank you for this opportunity. Today we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And gentlemen, today is Sabbath. Tomorrow is Father's Day, so you have permission to lie down tomorrow morning. We won't be having any work programs tomorrow, okay? You're welcome. I would have thought that would have earned a bigger amen from the men. They don't. <laughs> Happy Sabbath, everyone. Weren't those some lively promotions? I'm telling you, I'm so sorry to follow up with some announcements. No, I'm just kidding. Um, the New English translation of the Bible in First Chronicles chapter 16, verse 23 says, Sing to the Lord all the earth. Announce every day how he delivers. I have some announcements for you beyond that. Our AY, Adventist Youth, will be meeting today, the 17th of June, at 5 p.m. here at the, church, the Youth Center. And the topic of discussion will be integrity. So needed in this time. Please make a special effort to come out all the youth and all the young at heart. Participate and make it great. And now I need my glasses. You are invited to join us for the commencement ceremony for the elementary division of the BVI Seventh-day Adventist School. It will be held on Sunday, the 25th of June at 3.30 p.m. at the very same school's auditorium. The theme is be bold, be courageous, be your best. The motto is God maintains our path, we must maintain our walk. And the class text, it comes from Joshua 1, 9. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid nor be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Speaking of the Seventh-day Adventist school, please join us for graduation exercises for the secondary division. The theme is forget the mistakes, remember the lesson. Our motto is, failure is the condiment that gives success its flavor. The class text is James chapter 1, verse 12. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. The class colors will be emerald green, white, and black. But feel free to support wearing any version of those colors as well. The consecration service will be on Friday the 30th of June at 7.15 p.m. at the East End Seventh-day Adventist Church. The baccalaureate service, I'm sure I pronounced that wrong, will be, uh, thank you, Saturday 1st July at 9 a.m. at the school's auditorium. And the commencement ceremony again is on Sunday the 2nd of July at 3.30 p.m. BVI Seventh-day Adventist School Auditorium. 
this will be sent out in announcements um, so that you all can see and remember because hearing that is a lot to remember. Next Sabbath, you heard it from Brother Benjamin, but I'm going to repeat it because it's worth repeating. It's Outreach Sabbath. We will be having church at what time? You were listening. And class track distribution will be at what time? 10 a.m. So that after service, we'll have a little light refreshment, gather together into our classes, masses, and get ready to go forth and distribute tracts. And what time is the outreach service at the landfill? I don't sense excitement over that. 5 p.m. We're going to go out and praise the Lord. Church, let us please continue to, or if we haven't been continuing, let us start to please play, pray for, call, even visit the elderly, the sick, the shut-in, hospitalized and grieving members of our church, our families, our communities, our territory, and our world. And, of course, please let us remember, pray for, attend, and participate in our Sunday and Wednesday night services, both of which start at 7.15 p.m. sharp. Right here, by the way. And the final announcement, which is perhaps the most urgent and pressing, we're celebrating Father's Day here today. We want to celebrate our fathers because they are wonderful gifts of God to us from the Father God. May we all have a wonderful blessing. Good to see you. Okay, this is a beautiful, beautiful Sabbath day. Amen. It's Father's Day, and we started this morning by using hymns from our old hymn book. This is a precious book to me. Sister Beverly has been a Seventh-day Adventist for the past 12 years. So you know the new hymnal is much older than that. So she's relying on all of us. I'm not showing off and I'm not bragging off, but I have been a Seventh-day Adventist, baptized Seventh-day Adventist since I was 11. I grew up in the Seventh-day Adventist church, though. I'm one of those projects of Brand Sabbath School. So I, was, I grew up in the church. And I'm now, those who are bright and know my age, know that it is 50 years that I have been singing these songs of faith. So we are going to go into the old hymnal. We are going to sing hymn 556. And I want to hear you singing with the angels. 556. Angels' voices sweetly singing. <coughs> Angels' voices sweetly singing, echoes through the blue tone ringing, news of wondrous gladness bringing, heart is heaven at last, heaven at last. Joyful story of heaven at last. Heaven at last. Heaven at last. Endless, boundless glory in heaven at last. On the jasper treasures. Too 
torrents of sin and of anguish sweep on my sinking soul and I perish, I perish Demaster who oh, hasten and take control the winds the waves shall obey my will peace be still whether to rot or the storm to see or demons or men or whatever may be no water can swallow the ship where lies the master of ocean and land lies that holy city built by God's own hands oh praise the Lord just over that mountain that promised land lies the holy city built by God's own hand as a weary Splendor gleaming from the tombs of 
This one is for you, men. Standing by a purpose truth. Number. Heeding God's command. <coughs> All the time, the faithful few. All hail to Daniel's band. What kind of fathers we have? 497. <coughs> Some people want to show off that they have the old hymnal. <laughs> Standing by a purpose true, even God's command, honor them to faithful few, all hail to Daniel's mind. Dare to be a Daniel, dare to stand alone, dare to have a purpose for man, dare to make it known. Shout for Daniel's man, oh. man, dare to be a Daniel, dare to 
bless you. Spirit of the living God, Fall afresh on me. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Melt me, mold me, fill me. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on all. The church is now called to worship. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son. Heavenly Father, as we gather into your house this morning, we gather in your presence because we know in your presence there is fullness. Lord, disappoint us not as we wait for a blessing today, is my prayer in your most holy name. Amen. Amen. Joyful, joyful, we adore thee. God of glory, Lord of love. Our hymn this morning is hymn number 12. Hymn number 12, joyful, joyful, we adore thee. We will be singing the first and the last stanzas only. Joyful, joyful, we God of glory, Lord of love, hearts on the full tribe flowers before thee, hail thee as the sun above, let the clouds of sin and sadness try to toy coat out of me. My second task for this morning 
is to welcome you all here into the house of the Lord. Isn't it a wonderful place to be today? Yes. Do you feel welcome? Yes. So then my job is done. Yes. No? I was getting a bit nervous during praise and worship because I thought of when David danced his clothes off and I'm saying, Sister Donnie, you got to keep them on. <laughs> She was sure having a wonderful, wonderful time with those very old hymns that some of us may have forgotten, you know, and I really enjoyed Master the Tempest is Raging. I remember that much from when I was a little girl going to crusades, and I know it word for word, and that's the only place I really hear the song. So, Sister Donna, if I can probably beseech on your behalf, one of these Sabbaths, we're going to have an oldie goldie Sabbath. And then we're going to sing those old songs and find out their meanings, and it will be a whole wonderful time. That's a fair deal, right? Yeah. A, fa a fair deal. So I just want to welcome all of you here with us today. We are celebrating our fathers. You know, we as Seventh day Adventists celebrate fathers on Sabbath. And of course, on Sunday is the official day according to, according to the rest of the world, and they will do their thing, but we celebrate them today. So, that's the general welcome for everybody. But I have a special welcome for the fathers. And this is how special you are, fathers. At 3 o'clock this morning, when I should be asleep, I was writing a poem just for you. So, here is my poem, and I hope that you get the message from it. You were assigned by God to take the lead to be the head of your household to pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, and love. The assignment came from the good Lord above. We have great fathers right here in Carrot Bay. We are so delighted that we can celebrate with you today. You are admired for the many things that you do. Let me give you a breakdown if you think it's not true. Among us, we have pastors and elders, Sabbath school teachers and superintendents, who bring us the word, sometimes in very creative ways so that we wouldn't forget what we've learned. Don't take the deacons lightly. They have their place too, for without their dedication, boy, what will we do? We have choristers and worship leaders who lead us in song with passion, backed up by our ever faithful and humble musicians. We have our tech team and communications crew Yes, some of them, some of them are fathers too. Oh, you young daddies, I have not forgotten you. You are our AY leaders that are willingly paving the way so that your sons too can be awesome leaders for Christ someday. We have some of our dads who create magic in the kitchen. If you were to taste their cuisines, they are always finger licking. Then we have the retired ones who have done their task. But I guarantee you, they are still willing, if only we ask. If there are daddies visiting us, we also appreciate you, for I am confident you are amazing fathers too. Now, if I have forgotten anyone, I ask please to be forgiven. After all, it's a requirement to get us into heaven. So now that I've said enough, and I know I've spoke the truth, we, the ladies of the Carrot Bay Seven Adventist Church, would like to wish the very best Father's Day to you. Amen. Sister Donna, you know, many times those old hymns. I use my old hymnal when I'm home sometimes, and I just sing my heart out. They all lift, uplift my spirit. Our upcoming deaconess says, can you take your place, please? Let us all pray. Our Father and our God who art in heaven, Lord, we just want to thank you for the Sabbath day of rest that we have set aside and cast our only thoughts away and think on you and heaven. Lord, as we want to thank you for the six working days of toil and labor, 
And you have given us money. You have given us so many gifts. And if, as we return your portion to you, we ask your blessing upon it that it may go to further your works and to help others to come to know you before time changes to eternity. May you continue to bless us all. We pray with thanksgiving. Is my prayer in your name. Amen. You can't be and you may be seated. Children, it is your time, and I'm inviting you all to come forward as we get ready for Auntie Linda to come and give you your story. Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world. Red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. Jesus died for all the children, all the children of the world. Red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. Jesus died for all Sorry, I have to hold this thing so I can speak into it. I'm so sorry. And cold? Oh, wow. That's a lot. Let's do something different, okay? So what day are we celebrating today? And the... Uh, and the... Uh, starts with an S. We come here every seven days to celebrate the... Sabbath. Sabbath. Good. And we're also celebrating Daddy's. Who loves their daddy? Me. How many of you know that you have a bigger daddy Me. than just your daddy? Who's your bigger daddy? 
God. Oh, wow. Yes, you're right. You're absolutely right. He's the biggest daddy of them all. He's bigger than even granddaddy and daddy, 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 and all the other daddies in between and before. So I wanted to talk to you today about God, our daddy's love for us. Did you guys know that God loves you? Did you guys know that God loves you? How much does he love you? You know a big word. We were going to talk about that. Do you know that you can show what infinity looks like? Like how much? Like how... Okay, yes, yeah, so there is a symbol, but even with just your body, you can show how much God loves you. Can anybody guess how you do that? Show us. Ah, she hugged him. But you know, you don't, even, you don't even need anybody else to show that. Can I, can I teach you guys a trick? No. Oh, wow. If you put one arm this way and the other arm this way, all at the same time, you guys might need to spread out. You might need to spread out. Spread out quickly. Spread out, spread out, spread out, spread out, spread out, spread out. Put your hands out. All the way, all the way, all the way. Lift your arm up high. What does that look like? Hi, hello, hello, hello. No, 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 no. It looks like the cross. Jesus spread his arms out like that. And when you, if you need to spread out some more, you don't have to touch. Can, can this hand touch the other one when it's going all the way that way? That's infinity love of God. And to show you, I need two volunteers. Who's going to take one piece of string? I'm going to pick the person who's not standing all up on me and is not saying me, 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 like you're singing. Thank you. Not you. Me. Who's Kaden? Actually, I'm going to get a girl. And go all the way that way. And go all the way that way. Are you guys? You lost it? Take the string, take the string. Is that a long string? Go all the way to the end. All the way to the end. Not, not today. Okay, so let's pretend that this is a line going, oops, I'm so sorry, all the way to infinity. And these lines can never touch. This is like how big God is because God is an infinite God. He's an infinite daddy. Of course, so we're just pretending because it's like um, an example. It's like a symbol. Okay, no limbo. Thank you. Not today. You got it? It's nice and straight? And it's not a guitar either. Everybody take one big step backwards. Excellent. Okay, so we're pretending that this is God's love and this is God's lifeline. Can anybody see this little dot? Yes, that's it. I can see it. No, no, no. <laughs> you hold it straight. You see this tiny, tiny little dot? It's a little knot. This little knot is how big compared to the rest of the string? It's tiny. You can barely see it. Did you know that our life from the time that we are born in our daddy's arms and to the time that we, if we live a hundred years or a hundred, hundred years, we never live a hundred years, most of us. 
Yeah, but no matter how long we live, our lives will only look like this tiny, tiny, tiny little dot in comparison to God's lifeline. And did you know that he wants you to live as long as he does? Forever and ever and ever infinity? He wants to take our tiny little life and turn it into that long. How can we do that? How can we live as long as by obeying him? That's one nice answer. Anybody got any other ideas? By caring. By caring, that's nice too. But there's something really specific that he does for us. By loving. And his love goes on forever. But what did God do that we couldn't do that makes us able to live with him forever? Walk on water. You, now, now you, know, you know none of us can do that. That's right. But that's not what he did to help us live forever and ever and ever. He, he, he sacrificed himself for us. Amen. He sacrificed himself. And what were you going to say? I was going to say he died on the cross for us. He died on the cross. He gave his life for us so that he can give us eternal life with him. It's not just eternal life on earth forever with him. Okay, so thank you so much for holding the string. Can you guys come back in and bring the string? Oh, wait, 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 wait. One, I almost forgot. Did you know that God's love for us doesn't just go on for eternity, but it's so deep? If we took this string and put it right at the top of the ceiling and it comes down with those, would we be able to touch the two ends? That's how deep his love for us is. We would need to fly high. We would be going up forever and ever and ever and down forever and ever and ever. We would need, we would need the most incredible airplane that was ever, ever, ever conceived and we would still run out. And we would still run out. So there's this beautiful song called How Deep the Father's Love for Us Is. Have you guys ever heard that? Come this way. Come this way. Come. Come. How deep the Father's love for us. How? Ow. Thanks, Robin. That, you really, thank you. <laughs> How vast beyond all measure. So whenever you think of your daddy, and whenever you look at your daddy, understand that your daddy God gave you your daddy because he loves you so much. And he wanted to be, and you never saw? You never, really? Oh, wow. But you've seen him though. Yeah, and does he love you? Yes, he does. Our earthly daddies, our earthly daddies represent our loving father in heaven. And one day, our earthly father in heaven is going to take us home, all the daddies and all the daughters and all the sons. Thank you. Bring the string. Bring the string. Thank you. Home to be in heaven with him and then to live forever and ever and ever. Amen. Speaking of which, can we say that special prayer to our father in heaven? Do we all know it? Yeah, we're all going to bow our heads and close our eyes. And we're all going to, okay, so you're going you're gonna to say it into the mic, but all the rest of us are going to say it with you, okay? And you're bowing down, thank you. So let's start together. Let's start together. We're going to bow. Our eyes closed. Oh, big boys and girls, can you pray with us as well, please? Oh, Father, who is heart in heaven. Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, and as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who are trespass against us, that lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Dime in the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
and a little child shall lead them. Thank you so much, boys and girls. When you go back, can you give your daddies a big hug? You want to? What do you want to do? Oh, you want to pray too? You go ahead, girl. You go ahead, girl. Let's pray. Let's pray. Let's pray. Let's pray. Our Father, thank you for making us. Thank you. Thank you for making all of us. And thank you for this wonderful Sabbath day. Thank you for making everybody. And thank you for making the perfect people that you will ever love. Thank you for making us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen, amen. I, I want to pray too. Not pray you. Pray you pray next time. Pray. You pray next time, okay? Thank you. Bye. Good morning, church. Today's scripture reading is taken from Matthew chapter 3, verse 1 to 17. Please stand. In those days, John the Baptist came, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is he who has spoken of through the prophet Isaiah, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, Prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. John's clothes were made of camel's hair, and he had a leather belt around his waist. His food was locusts and wild honey. People went out to him from Jerusalem and all Judea and the whole region of Jordan. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. But when he saw of the many Pharisees and Sadducees coming to where he was baptizing, he said to them, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit, fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not think you can say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. I tell you that out of, the, of these stones, God can raise up children of Abraham, for Abraham. The axe is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me comes one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear with his threshing floor, gathering his wheat into the barn and burning up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? Jesus replied, Let it be so now. It is prosperous. It is, the, it is prosper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Amen. This ends the scripture reading. Amen. You may be seated. Oh. 
righteous eternal Father, whom art in heaven. Holy and precious is your name. This morning, dear God, we are so thankful that you have spared our lives to see yet another day. Not just any other day, but this beautiful Sabbath day. And for this, oh God, we give you the glory, we give you the praise and the honor that is due unto your holy and most wonderful name. Lord, as we turn us on our side, uh, our bed this morning, Lord, we recognize how good you are. We recognize your love. We recognize, oh God, your mercy towards us. We recognize, dear God, your willingness that none of us should perish, but all of us should come to repentance. Amen. Father God, we thank you, dear God, this morning, dear God, that we can come in your, in your tabernacle unmolestedly, and Lord, where we can worship you in freedom. Father God, this morning, so many, oh God, are hiding. So many don't have the privilege that we have to come in your courts. And so we give you the thanks and we give you the praise. Father God, this morning we want to bring before you, O oh God, even the men of the church as we celebrate fathers. Father God, we thank you, O oh God, for the way that you have designed the family for mothers and fathers and the role that you have given them to play. But yet, Lord, it is because of our sinfulness we have turned away, O oh God, from what you designed the families to be, and we have done our own thing. And as a result, dear God, we are seeing our children suffering. We are seeing, oh God, our young people are going astray. We are seeing so many of our young men in the prison, oh God, and filling up the prison and all other activities, dear God. Please forgive us, dear God, where we have failed you. Father God, we want to pray, dear God, for the men Lord, who have taken on that responsibility and who have heeded, oh God, your words according to Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 4 that reminds them to train up their children, to bring them up in the discipline and the instructions of the Lord. We thank you for those fathers. And we ask, dear God, that each and every day that you will give them your wisdom, your knowledge, and your understanding, that they will continue, dear God, to Bring their household, O oh God, in the way that you want them to in the, bring up their children in the fear and admonition of the Lord. Your words remind us, dear God, that we are to train up our children in the way that they are to go, so that when they are old enough, they will not depart from it. I pray, dear God, that this will continue to be the sentiments of many of our homes, dear God, that our children, O oh God, will be like plants round about our house, dear Father, as your word has reminded us. I pray, dear God, that the husbands, as they are the house, head of the household, that they will continue to let that light shine before their children. Because we know that children imitate, oh God, what they see. And so I pray, dear God, that there will be that shining light, that beacon of hope in that home. And Lord, that your name will be seen and praised in our homes each and every day. Continue to bless us as a church. Help us to rally around, oh God, our young people, that, Lord, even when we see them going astray, that we will continue to encourage them. Continue to bless our efforts and continue, oh God, as we continue to worship you. We pray even for the one who's going to bring forth your message. I pray, dear God, that you will give her, oh God, your wisdom as well, your knowledge and your understanding. So as she brings forth the message, oh God, Jesus Christ and him will be lifted up and self will be crucified. In Jesus' name we pray. There is a place of full release near to the heart of God. I place where all is joy and peace near to the heart of God. Oh, cheers. 
Happy Sabbath, church. I hope you are blessed by this song.
today, I would like to join with the others in extending a happy Father's Day to all of our fathers. I am not sure if my eyes seen right, but if my eyes is seeing Brother L's, I would like him to stand. And I assume this is your lovely wife. Daughter, please stand. Brother Els, welcome back to the BVI. I know you're probably, probably passing through, but welcome back. It's, I'm happy to see you. Those of you, um, especially the young people way back in the 80s, when we have joint session, fun, laughter, Brother Els was the person to make us laugh. Happy to see you, brother. I'm looking at the time, and I'm going to try my best. I know that the ladies are preparing lunch for us, so the 15 minutes you would have taken to drive home, can I use it? Because you just have to go right, not even outside. Your lunch will be right inside. All right? So we're working together. Okay. <clears throat> Press by your pair. I look at this word over and over again. And I was even wondering if I was pronounced it right. Press by your pair. This is a common condition that affects your ability to focus on nearby objects as you age. So I'm putting on mine. It usually starts around 40, and it worsens around 65. So I'm right there. It can cause blur vision. Sometimes I'm walking and I'm, I, I, I'm seeing the, 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 the built, but the face is hard to see. So I have to strain my eyes. Sometimes it causes headache as we are straining our eyes. And difficulty in reading small print. Sometimes it's not really difficulty in reading the small print but is more in identifying that there is a small print. I remembered going to do an eye test, and when I looked through the machine and started to name the letters, I thought I did pretty well, until I was asked to continue. And I was like, continue? You don't have anything else. And the person said to me, there is a line of letters below. Trust me, I had no clue that there was another line with letters. So figure it out, I am here with my glasses. This makes two realities perfectly, or perfectly clear. One. My vision had changed and I needed glasses to help me to see clearly. And two, it made me realize that one's vision has the ability to change so gradually that it is unnoticeable to the point where what was once so common becomes out of focus and unrecognizable. Let us pray. Father in heaven, have your way. Revive us, reform us. I ask in your name, amen. Focusing on fatherhood. The ability to see clearly is important. Fatherhood and fatherlessness are issues in our nation that are in desperate need of immediate clarity of focus and of our attention. 
One critical aspect of fatherhood that is plaguing our society in the epidemic proportion is fatherlessness. Throughout the world, father absenteeism is pervasive and the ramifications are devastating. Fatherlessness adversely affects individuals. It affects our families, our neighborhood, our churches, our cities, and our nation. Studies show that fatherlessness impacts education, poverty levels, social behaviors, healthcare, emotional development, and the list of other factors that are essential to our children's well-being. Coupled with the fatherless crisis in the, in the innate struggle, men encounter is not only trying to be a present father, but being a good father as well. Being present is one thing, but being a good father is a whole other ball game. Many dads are in the home, but being present is no guarantee that they are loving and nurturing father God intends for them to be in their home. A present father, bad dad, can have done more, can have done equal, and in some cases, more damage to their children and family than an absent dad. Men who love their families constantly grappled with the question, how can I be a better dad? How can you be a better dad? Have you asked yourself, where can the average man find out what it takes to be a good dad? The short answer is not in too many places. Spiritually, our fatherhood crisis has created a relational and theological challenge as it, as it relates to our Heavenly Father. We call God of the universe our Father, and yes, He is. God is our loving Father, and He is a good Father. However, our current fatherhood fog distorts His image in the hearts of those who are desperately longing for a father's love. They can only see him through the lenses of their personal experience, not our positive social commentary. I remembered once speaking to a young lady who was struggling with a sexual abusive father. It started in her early teen and was still happening up until when we spoke. She knew it was wrong and wanted a way out. She hated her father because of the abuse he has inflicted on her. She had recently come to the faith in Jesus and in her honesty expressed to me how the concept of God as a father was unsafe for her. The graffiti masking the accurate image of God the Father in this young lady's life was a result of the massive failing of her natural father. Like this young lady, there are many people whose image of our Heavenly Father is unsafe. They are unable to experience the ultimate love of Father God because of the pain caused by their earthly father. However, regardless of where you are on the fatherhood spectrum, there is hope and help available for you. There is hope and help available for you if your daily existence involves coping with the chronic pain of a father's womb caused by an absent father or an abusive father. There is hope and help available for you if your feeling of inadequacy and the ability to be a good father. There is hope and help available for you if you are longing for the love of your heavenly father 
but you are too afraid to let go and fall into the embrace of his loving and awesome arms. Yes, hope and help available for you. And this is found in the revelation of God our Father through his son Jesus Christ. In our scripture reading, Matthew 3 and verse, verses 1 to 17, we can find God's blueprint to fatherhood. And I repeat that. In Matthew 3, verses 1 to 17, we can find hope in God's blueprint to fatherhood. It tells of the story of Jesus' baptism. This passage speaks powerfully to the issue fatherhood and fatherlessness. Though the passive mark, the inauguration of Jesus' earthly ministry, these verses allow us the privilege of beholding one of the most intimate interaction between Jesus and his Father. In the beauty of this moment, we see the Father and the Father disclose. Sorry. In the beauty of this moment, we see Jesus acting in loving obedience to his Father, and the Father disclosing to the world unashamedly how deeply he loves his Son. The divine warmth of this Father and Son embrace, radicates four life-changing truths that powerfully address the subject of fatherhood. These verses give us insight to one, the basic needs of our children. Two, how men can be good fathers. Three, the one who has the power to heal. And four, our deepest father's wound. In this passage, we see that God the Father is present with his son. The first truth we see in the passage, as soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. And at that very moment, heaven was open, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lightning on him. There was sick and lightning on him, and we can find that in Matthew 3, 16. There was a singing group called The Temptation. Those of you who are old as me and older might be familiar. They had a hit song on the radio entitled, Papa was a rolling stone. The lyrics communicated the far too familiar fatherless saga. The main tag in the, in the song was fatherless lament of a broken family. The words were, Papa was a rolling stone. Wherever he laid his hat was his home. And when he died, all he left was alone. Sad to say this. This is the story of many fathers. Currently, in a world today, millions of children under the age of 18 go to bed at nine with no father present. In the article, The Facts from Father's Facts, it said that in America, 24.7 million children live in a biologically fatherless or father-absent home. And 20.3 million live with no father, whether it's biological, adoptive, or step in the home. These percentage represent not just sterile numbers, but children like yours and mine who long daily for their daddy's love and affection. However, each day, the hold in their soul remains a barren canon because a father is not present to fulfill the longing of their young hearts. Their dads are missing in action. Here is an example. Five-year-old Christopher was standing outside the door of the church where his grandmother was inside serving people who needed clothes and bread. Standing there on the curb, enjoying the sunshine, waiting for Granny to finish, a strange man rides up 
to Christopher on a bike and began to talk to him. The stranger begins his inquiry by asking Christopher, do you know who I am? With the childlike honesty, Christopher tells the man, I don't know who you are. To which the stranger reply, I am your biologic, um, biological daddy. Biological daddy? Christopher was thinking, what in the world is a biological daddy? The strangeness of this man's response prompted Christopher to call his grandmother. He said to grandma, you need to come outside. There is a man out here who says he is my biological daddy. When his grandmother stepped out the door, sure enough, it was his biological father on the bike. She greeted him, and then the biological daddy took $5 out of his pocket and gave it to Christopher. He promised he would come by to visit him. Years have passed. As the old people in will say, yours have passed. However, and the man on the bike has not shown up again. God the Father did not abandon his son, Jesus. The Bible tells us that when Jesus came out of the water, the Holy Spirit descended and rested on him. Yes, the spirit, was overpower the spirit was the overpowering agent in Jesus' ministry. However, this was also a sign that God was present with his son. In, his spirit was resting on Jesus. He was not going to leave him fatherless. God the Father would always be there for his son. If God thought it was important to let the whole world know that he was present with his son, how important it is for fathers today to be present with their children. Yes, many obstacles and challenges from being present with children, such as whether it's decline in marriage, divorce, addiction, antagonistic relationship with the child's mother, legal issues, work, teenage pregnancy, sin, and selfishness. However, as a dad, you do not have the luxury of wimping out. So no matter the situation, fathers, your children need you. Make an inward resolve to fight through the barriers, whether they are real or is just your excuses. God was present with his son, and he can give you the grace, strength, and courage to be present with your children. A good father is a present father. God the Father acknowledges his son. In the passage of scripture, we also see God the Father acknowledging his son. He thunders these words, this is my son. Speaking from heaven, God the Father makes a bold declaration to the world saying, this is my son. In essence, he's saying, this is my son. No one make a mistake about it. He belongs to me. I am his father and he is my son. God the Father leaves no ambiguity surrounding his relationship to Jesus Christ. Jesus is clear on who is his father, and so were those who heard the father speak. In our fatherless culture today, children and adults and adults are longing to hear those life-giving words from their father. Those of us who have grown up with or have fathers who have conveyed that message to our hearts are very blessed and fortunate. However, sadly, there are countless individuals who long for their father's acknowledgement but never receive it. The story is told of a young man in whom Jesus Christ 
has done a wonderful work in his heart and life. He went through some very difficult times that from his own admission stem from never having been acknowledged by his dad. In his 30s now, he has only seen his dad one time in his life. During that brief meeting, the words spoken to him from his father's lips were, I am not your daddy. He stated, and I quote, my mother had always told me that my father was a policeman. So one day, a policeman was visiting our house. I was only five, so I was so happy, I asked the man in the blue uniform with his shiny badge, are you my daddy? He responded by telling me, no, I am not your daddy. Sadly, he was. When the door closed behind him, my mother said to me, that was your father. Those brief moments I spent with the policeman were tragic for two reasons. One, it was the first time I saw my father, and it was the last time I ever saw him. I heard he had two other children, but his presence and influence in my life is non-existence. The sad truth was he wanted my mom to abort me. However, praise God, my mom chose differently. She decided to let me live and devoted my life to the Lord to be used for his purposes. I have heard about a ceremony in the Jewish tradition called the Act of Redemption. It speaks powerfully of the need that this young man and others to have a father acknowledgement. The ceremony goes as follows. On the child's 31st day, a child is brought to the rabbi in the presence of the family and guests. When the father approaches the altar with the child, he is asked if he desires to leave the child or to redeem him. If the father chooses to redeem the child, he hands a special coin to the rabbi and the rabbi pronounces three times in the presence of the company of people, your son is redeemed, your son is redeemed, your son is redeemed. Afterward, the child is returned to the father. The implication of this ritual are revetting. For one, the father publicly acknowledges that he accepts full responsibility for his son before God and the people. Second, the son grows up knowing that his dad had a choice to leave him or to redeem him. Knowing that he has a father who wanted him and chose him had great positive spiritual, emotional, and psychological implication throughout the child's life. Just as God acknowledged his son, natural fathers are expected to do the same. In an age where many children do not even have a father's name on their birth certificate, this ritual speaks volumes to the important and need for fathers to acknowledge their children. You know, sometimes I feel for mothers who have to go to the court to get child support. God the Father acknowledged his son. As dads, you have the responsibility and the privilege of acknowledging your children too. In verse 17, we also hear and see God expressing his love for his son. This is my son whom I love. A story is told about the death of a young man. At his funeral, the church was packed wall to wall with grieving young people attempting to make sense out of this needless and so final situation. 
the diseased young man live a life involved in gangs. What was gathered from some of the comments of the adults there was he felt trapped and did not see a way out of his lifestyle. Once the eulogy was over, the funeral directors opened a casket so friends and family could say their final farewells. Typically, what follow is unusual standard fare. Tears are shared, words of goodbye are spoken, and stares into the heaven are made. However, during the viewing, something strange happened. A tall man, well-dressed, came and stood over the casket and stared into space. After standing there for what seemed like an extremely long time, he removed his tie from his neck and placed it on his son's head. He then went back to his seat. Moment passed and he proceeded to the casket once again. This time while standing there, he took off his watch and placed it on his son's hand. Then he also removed a chain from his neck and placed it on the young man as well. Observing this, father grieving over his son is puzzling. It seems strange and somewhat odd that the father would place these objects on his son in such a bizarre, bizarre manner. After the service, a woman who was like the boy's mother said what was going on. She stated the man was the boy's father. She made clear in no uncertain terms that the dad had not fathered the young man and pretty much had been out of his life for most of his years. After reading this story, it hits me. This father was not dealing with grief alone, but with guilt as well. In placing these useless objects on his son's cold body, in essence, he was trying to fulfill in a pitiful way his fatherly duties. Sad to say, he was too late. The question one may ask, why didn't he give his son a tie and teach him how to tie it when he was nine or 10 years old? How come he didn't give his son a Mickey Mouse watch and teach him how to tell the time when he was still in grade school? What kept this man from loving his son? God's love for Jesus was not only mere words and sentiment. His love for Jesus was expressed through tangible ways and actions. God the Father lived in close proximity to Jesus to know what he needed. In Matthew 6, 9 to 13, the Lord's Prayer is teaching us how to pray. Jesus shows us how our loving Father is committed to meeting our needs as his children. Here are a few brief observations from the Lord's Prayer. He is present and attentive, our Father who is in heaven. He desires the best for his children, his kingdom and will be done. He provides for his children's needs, give us our daily bread. He forgives his children, forgive us our debts. He protects his children from evil, deliver us from evil. So many times, fathers think their only responsibility is to provide food, clothing, and shelter. Not so. Children have other needs too. Fathers have the privilege of being fathers who live in close, loving proximity with their children so that so that so they can best know how to meet their needs and show them love. I remember, I think it was sometime last term, a teacher called me. Mrs. Leonard, I need, I have a case for you. 
So I went to the classroom and I asked her what happened. So she was pointing to a young student, a guy. She said, he's crying. So I pull him aside and I said, what happened to you? So he said, he went to sleep last night and when he woke up, his father was gone. And this is his whole life. He wants his father to be there when he wakes up in the morning. So, you know, the teacher, I think she heard what he was saying and she was saying, you know, he should be happy that his dad was there when he went to bed. But this young man is calling for more. He knows that dad should be there from beginning to end. And that's what he wanted. You know, but it's a sad situation because dad does not belong to mom. So dad has two homes. So dad is doing his best, I guess, in his I'm here to the beginning and I'm over here for the end. But the young lad could not understand that. In these verses, the father is also affirming his son. God tells the world, this is my son whom I love with him and I am well pleased. Affirmation is powerful and we all need it desperately. Time will not permit us to talk about all the casualties and heartaches of life people have experienced in search for healthy affirmation. I find this phase of the text so amazing. Here God tells the world that Jesus is his son, whom he loves, and that, it, and that he is well pleased. Think about it for a moment. At this point in Jesus' life, he has not even yet preached a sermon, heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out any demons, call his disciples, died on the cross, risen from the grave. But yet his father was well pleased with him. However, the father validates him not for what he has done or for the future work he will do. The father affirmed Jesus solely because of who he is, his beloved son. You know, sometimes we hear stories about sons who were abandoned by their dads, and it's only when the sons become famous and rich, that is when the dad appears. Or at a graduation, I remember I saw a dad come in with a big camera and, and um, stand like that. And when I needed money for CXC, it was promise, 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 I never received. But the day of graduation, that thing took up all the space to the front, and he felt good. That's what it is. Fathers, can you remember the countless times when you got home that your children would run to you? and tell you something that they have experienced during the day. You may or not be so impressed with the basketball shot that your son were able to make or the project your daughter was working on. However, as their father, I'm sure that you would always say, good job, good job. You are doing great, go on. Encoded in your message, was not only praise about their accomplishment, but the affirmation of them as a person. As children and human on a whole, we love affirmation. At a man's retreat, a group of 30 to 40 men of all ages sat in a room in the presence of God and one another, sharing joys and deep aches of the soul. Sitting in the chair with his face buried in his hand, his head occasionally rising up, Jason sobbed. Why don't he want me? I don't understand why my dad don't want me. Why don't he want me, man? What's wrong with me? None of the older men 
or the young men in the room had the answer to his question. But they knew the problem. Young Jason was crying out for the acceptance and affirmation of his father. He was saying, am I such a defect that I am unlovable as a son? What happened next was absolutely beautiful and unscripted. Phil, an older man in the group, got up out of his seat and walked over to Jason. He embraced him and in a loud voice said to him, Jason, I'll be your dad and you are my son. Moreover, until Phil's death, he lived up to those words. One night after a conference addressing fatherless, facilitate healing and equipping individuals to cope with, to cope, the presenter was walking to the door when two women approached him with tears of joy streaming down their faces. One of the women was an 80-year-old lady who grabbed his hands and asked, where were you 50 years ago? I live all these years with this father pain, and tonight God gave me what I desperately long for. I didn't even know this could happen. At that same conference, the men were paired up with each other and looking each other directly into their eyes and say to each other, you are my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Men who were strangers melting like butter fell into one another's arm. Shame or embarrassment had no place in that moment. The presence of God, the Father, filled the auditorium. Men of all ages and colors, some of the first time that night heard life-giving words affirming them as a beloved son. You may be like Jason or the 80-year-old woman longing for affirmation of your father. I want to tell you, you are not flawed or unlovable. Amen. Though your earthly father may never affirm you, your heavenly father will. It was God the Father's pleasure to affirm Jesus, and it is his pleasure to affirm you. Hear these words today. You are his child. He loves you, and he is well pleased with you. Dads, make sure you take the time to speak life-giving words to your children too. They need desperately to hear them. Conclusion, refocusing on fatherhood. Today, you may be a person who is living with a father's wound. Your earthly father may have failed you, but God will not. He promises to be the father you, will all, you always wanted and needed. Just as he opened the heaven to proclaim his son, to proclaim his love for his son, he will touch the pain in your heart and pour out love and mercy to heal your deepest wounds. Today you may be longing to be a better father to your children. Follow the example of God's blueprint. Be present with your children physically and emotionally. Find creative ways to let your children know that they are yours and that you will not trade them in for the world. Understand, yes, you are not perfect, but who is? Stop beating yourself up over, the short, over your shortcoming. Rely on your loving father to give you the grace you need to be the father he wants you to be. He will help you to be a present, acknowledging, loving, and affirming to your children. Today, your heart may be burdened for the many fatherless children living 
in your extended family or the church or the community. Allow the Father's heart to become your heart. Find a child to whom you can be a mentor. Become a big brother, a surrogate dad or a grandpa. Be there for them and share the heart of your heavenly Father with them. Let them know how valuable they are and how much God and you love them. There is no need to try to be a pro. Just being present in a kid's life is invaluable. Remember, your praise makes a difference in the lives of fatherless too. Fatherhood is now. And by our Heavenly Father's wonderful grace, he's asking us to get active and make a difference in our children's life. Amen. 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 You know, we must thank Elder Sharon for such a wonderful presentation. And I know our fathers are empowered they are reminded of their responsibilities, and they are all leaving here with renewed vigor and strength to be the best daddies that they can possibly be. My, one person once said it takes one act to be a father, but it takes a lifetime to be a daddy. All right, so I trust that our men will be not just fathers, but daddies to their children. And we are also grateful to our Heavenly Father for his love, for his support, for his example. We are going to sing our hymn of dedication. Um, we are going to stand and sing hymn 304, Faith of Our Fathers, after which we will have our benediction. To for forfers living still in spite of time chance fire sword oh how our heart beat high with joy when every hell that glow I'm just 
reminding us all that we are having lunch with our fathers today. So as we are finished, we are going to sit and then we are going to have a wonderful swallowship with our fathers. Let us pray. Dear Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for such a day that we could not only celebrate the Sabbath, but we can celebrate our fathers. Lord, we know it's not an easy role for our fathers, so we place them in your hands. We place them in your hands to teach them, to guide them, to mold them, to grant them strength and wisdom and courage, that they will be the men, the leaders of their homes, the high priest that leads their family to you. Lord, we ask that you be with their wives, be with their children, be with their families. Help them to support them in this walk. Help, Lord, that as we stand as families that are trusting in you, that we will all be beacons in our communities that others may see. Lord, we ask that you be with our church. We ask that you be with those who are listening on air. Help us to be more like you. Help us to follow your blueprint in all that we do. Continue to guide, guard, and protect us. And even as we are about to eat, may the food we eat do our bodies good. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Oh, fathers, be faithful. Soon Jesus will come. For whom we have waited so long Oh, soon we shall enter a glorious home And join in the conqueror's song Oh, brother, be faithful for why should we Such deep, such unbounded and infinite love Who died to redeem us his own Who brothers be faithful the city of gold Prepared for the good and to bless It is within its portals For to unfold And will come in to die rest Then brother prevent For not long shall we stay Time's dark night of sorrow is where 